So, hi, yeah, I'm, for those who don't know me, I'm Dimi. I am um, based in Brussels and I work on, well, let's say advocacy for free knowledge, i.e. reforming copyright so that we can share more things. And um, what, um, so I, I basically thought we were going to have some, some glams around here today, some glam institutions. So I, I have a very short five minutes opening um, explanation of what we do. I guess most of you know it. Who here does not know what Wikimedia is doing advocacy wise? So I, I can briefly run through it so we know what, what our, where we're coming from. So of course, you know, we have this great, you know, thing. Um, everybody should have access to everything which is a great um, vision, but a bit like world peace when you go to an actual bureaucrat or a politician and ask them for world peace or for you know, giving free access to everybody in the whole world, to everything, they get scared and frustrated that they can't help you even if they want to help you. So what you need to do is uh, break it down to like more smaller, more feasible things and to things that are basically more or less already on the legislative agenda for the next few years and things that you can really ask for. Um, so we did this, we, we picked up um, three major um, uh, points. Um, we want to change the Orphan Works Directive, maybe in a few years this will be back on the agenda. Um, we want a universal freedom of panorama, and we want, of course, uh, public domain, to, to enlarge the public domain, and especially we're focusing on public domain for government works, works created by the, by the state, basically. Um, from a strategy perspective, so I never ask people to do something they can't help you with because that just frustrates them. Um, on the other hand, if you can make them feel that the things you're doing are little changes but they help them change the big picture, like they can do a little thing to achieve world peace maybe in 100 years, that will motivate them to help you. Um, number two, always pick things that are easily and practically um, practical to communicate to the public and I think we have things here because it's rather easy to explain why not being able to share a picture of the atonium is just haywire. Um, and it's also rather easy to go um, to talk to the French press or even a French government official and to tell them, look, this is uh, what your rules are doing. It's a picture of Jacques Chirac and it's a very important personality, but if you look at his profile picture, it's a bit skewed. He's looking to the side, not what you would expect from such an important historical personality. The reason for this is that um, we had to cut him out of a picture with Bill Clinton, and the reason for that is that the U.S. government puts everything they do in the public domain, while the French doesn't, so you know, now that's an incentive for the French government to actually think about it. Um, so yeah, as I said, we're concentrating on little fixes that have the potential, you know, to, to make a first step to changing the narrative to, to be game-changing. And um, we are really trying to play out our strengths, we're the small, cute guys. We have a mascot, and we're a group of people. Um, and um, of course, then we are trying to set up a structure, which I think could be very interesting also for GLAM institutions, where you basically have one person who sort of coordinates it and knows what's going on. But there are like um, tens, or hopefully one day even hundreds of people who, if they have during the year three hours time, or three days time, or three weeks time, they can just come say, hey, I have a few hours I would like to dedicate to this. Is there anything I want to work on, let's say, censorship? Is there anything I can do? And then the person who's coordinating them tells them, okay, this and this is going on. This is what the arguments are. You can talk to these and these people if you want to help. Um, so this is the structure we're trying to build up and we call liquid lobbying. Um, um, and I think this can be also reproduced for a lot of other institutions who just don't have the money to pay 10 full-time lobbyists to go around and you know, just bring their points forward. So when you have such a decentralized structure, uh, very important, and even without this, is to have a clear strategy. You need to know where you're going. So this is more or less how we decided we, we have to build up a strategy. First, you want a mission. This is like your global goal. World peace, free knowledge, whatever you're fighting for. Eradicate polio. Then um, set concrete goals, something that is achievable, that the person who works on a desk from 9 to 5 can actually help you with. Some small changes in the legislative text. Then you need to map out who you have to talk to, and the more detailed the better. Um, of course, everybody wants to talk, let's say, to the president or to the commissioner or to the minister, but actually you need to figure out, even before you start, whose desk in the ministry this is lying on, and then talk to their assistant. <laughs> um, it's, you would never try to start uh, 
climbing a tree from the top, you need to go from the bottom. And it, it takes some time, but this is like really the way forward because also the people who are working there permanently don't get exchanged as often as the people on the top. Um, then, even if nobody is ever going to read it, you need some report, some scientific proof that, you know, sort of support or some analysis, some statistics that support your uh, position. Um, from my experience, nobody ever reads these. Like, if you have three reports, 100 pages each, like one out of 100 people will actually open them. But just starting the sentence by, we have three studies saying this, already makes people listening to you a lot more. Um, and then once you're done with this, you basically think of communications, how, and tactics. So what am I saying? What is my message? Who am I talking to? And tactics would be, should I try to build up a friendly personal relationship with this person or get a thousand people on the street to demonstrate against it or talk to the media or, you know, which way to go? Um, there are many different tactics. Maybe you do a combination of all of these. Um, so, so far is the, um, the general strategy site, which also have like these do your own strategy three page uh, things to fill out. I can pass them around, but I have only 10 of them and feel free to take them home. But um, I also put it on MetaWiki, so, you know. Is it on the internet? It's, um, I, I, will, I can link it on the interpad after that. So, but anyways, for now, just also in case you're not Wikimedia and you want to do such a thing for your own institutions, we're here to help you um, do this with you. So, concretely, Paul already said, um, in the EU, um, the ones that we are not allowed to show pictures of because they're in Belgium and France where there is no freedom of panorama. Um, but you're in the Netherlands now where there is, so you can show the pictures. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think we're going by the rule on Wikimedia that the country of origin and the country where the server is hosted both need to, to be... Uh, this is what the, they told me last time on, on, on comments. So we don't have very clear rules. Anyway, um, the commission said copyright, one of their top priorities. And then, of course, we have now the parliament, in this case, Julia Reda, who is writing, who did um, a first draft of an own initiative report, which is legislatively non-binding, but it's very important because it basically tells the commission, look, this is what we expect from you, and this is what would likely pass this house. So the commission is looking at this report and actually will base many of its decisions, what it will do, on this report. Um, her report was, from our point of view and from cultural heritage institutions' point of view, very, very good. The problem is, she's a pirate, she's sitting in the green groups, and even like uh, without looking at the content, every pretty much everybody else is, is hell-bound on tearing it into bits and pieces. So what we're trying to do now is taking bits and pieces of this report, the ones that we care about most dearly, and trying to save them through the process. And um, I'll run you through two examples, and then Paul can talk about two more. I have the amendments, and I'll have the amendments on the screen. So first, I don't know whether it's readable to all of you. Um, on the left is the original text proposed by Julia Reda, and for the people um, here who maybe happen to know Matthias Schindler, he used to work for Wikimedia Deutschland, he basically wrote 90% of this report himself. And that's why in the German Ministry of, of um, uh, Justice, they call it Schindler's List. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so he proposed, um, this is basically freedom of panorama calls on the EU legislator to ensure that the use of photographs, video footage, and other images uh, permanently located in public places is permitted. Now, a huge group of, especially the conservatives, so the European People's Parties, but um, with um, some liberals and some extra conservatives and also some socialists, decided, no, 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 no way. I mean, this would be haywire. So they proposed um, to have um, a non-commercial clause included in this, which would then be if things go binding to all the countries. So this would actually be horrible because it would make, even in countries where you already have freedom of panorama, would enforce a non-commercial freedom of panorama if, the, if, if this stands. Um, so basically what we're doing now is uh, taking out all our arguments, telling them, look, if you include this in 14 countries that already have full freedom of panorama, things will get worse. So uh, trying to talk to them about it. And um, I believe, but this is, don't quote me on this yet because it's not public, but um, last I spoke to um, the European People's Party um, rapporteur on this, um, she agreed to cross out the last part shall be considered to be in the public domain where the use of this is not commercial. So she agreed to cross out the non-commercial part and to just soften the text, invite the EU legislator to recognize, which is 
a bit softer. Yeah, the, uh, should I look into the camera? <laughs> it's not public. Ah, well, I mean, it's it's public enough for this, but you know, don't tweet. It. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no worries. Um, so um, that's where we are. Um, we're just hoping to be able to cross off the last part because this would be horrible. On the other hand, if the first part stands, um, we are on the right track. Um, the second goal we have is, um, well, freedom of panorama. And this is just to demonstrate how more or less um, the advocacy uh, work works. So the, the first part was recommends the EU legislator to further lower very, you know, some diplomatically nicely sounding text and basically um, to exclude, uh, uh, exempt works produced by the public sector from copyright protection. Now this has a huge coalition of socialists, conservatives and liberals against it. Nobody likes it, everybody wants to delete it. When you ask about arguments, I'm still to hear the first argument why they want to delete it. We have no idea, they have no idea, but they just don't like it. Um, so we have, of course, from a priority perspective, first be concentrating on getting the non-commercial freedom of panorama thing off. So now we are starting to work a bit more on this. Um, luckily, there were two, so what we're doing is, instead of just saying we want to keep this, there are two um, people from the socialist group, which is the second biggest group, and if they ask for something, they're much more likely to get hurt than us. Um, they proposed basically a very slight alternation here. It recommends the EU legislator basically just to protect public interest. So we're trying to tell everybody else, no, no, don't do what we want, do what they want, and you know, sort of you know, be invisible in this game. Um, and we're trying to get the majority for this, so we have already two more groups, so um, more than half of the liberals already confirmed to us that they would support this, and um, the radical left also agreed to support it, so now we have to get most of the socialists on board, where the Italian socialists are the most important ones. Right now, it's <coughs> like the biggest group, so we're trying to get the Italians on board with this, and we'll see, but it's not so easy, but we have an Italian guy coming to Brussels to try to work with them. Um, and um, another thing, just to see how, how well, illogical it sometimes is. So this Romanian um, NEP from the socialist group said, OK, I actually really like this public domain thing. But most people in my group are afraid of data protection. And they feel like um, they don't know what it means um, pr produced by the public sector. Um, so what we told him, we told him, look, um, Data protection has nothing to do with copyright, because you know, no matter of the copyright status, data protection still exists. But if you feel strongly about it, uh, in ca instead of fighting with him, we told him, why don't you just write in half a sentence that says, while well, protecting personal information. So that's what he did. And we also pointed him to um, the US definition um, that basically says, which are produced by government employees as part of their official duty with him. So he, instead of asking this to be deleted, he proposed this change, which we can perfectly live with. Um, so basically, this is the daily work that's happening. Basically, try to get everybody who was against it, what is their problem, and then try to either point them to one of the already existing amendment changes or just propose them a new one that would not go against what you're doing. Um, I just brought up the case of Victor Negrescu because it worked perfectly. We basically wrote that. Um, so yeah, we'll see. We're trying to get a majority for this now. And um, yeah, it's right now we have like nine European chapters are working on that, so I'm, I'm hopeful. And... Um, Is it possible to tweet it? Uh, about PDGov? Yeah. The, the amendments? Yeah, they're okay public. They're yeah. public. They're already public. Yeah. They're all um, meetup as well, so... Okay. I'm taking notes. All right, and this, I think this is... No, the, the next one you wrote, but this is the next one about public domain. So yeah, this is... this. Uh, so, so maybe first of all, so... Um, I'm also part of, or Kenison is part of something called Comunia, which um, Dimi is also part of, and we're trying to coordinate activities in Brussels a little bit. I'm also doing, um, um, on behalf of Europeana, actually, kind of like paid, or at least like Europeana is, uh, is part of some projects. Like I'm also doing lobbying work on, on behalf of Europeana, so I go down there a lot, either with a Comunia hat on or, or with a um, Europeana hat on. And it's maybe interesting to talk a little bit more about the, the European I had on here, which is the, like, I'm very jealous of Dimi here, because Dimi, first of all, like, has an office in Brussels, um, is there all the time, and has this amazing network of um, people from the chapters who can, who, 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 unless he exaggerates, like, he can basically go like, oh, I need you, I need you, and like, the next day something is happening. 
um, working with the cultural heritage institutions is um, a somewhat slower process, right? Like you first need to get a mandate, there is like directors and associations who need to approve certain positions, like basically people are like, if you try to get someone working at an institution to do something tomorrow, that's impossible, like try over three weeks again. Like that's a general thing where somebody may have time to do something because everybody is increasingly busy. So um, it's it's a bit more challenging there. On the other hand, like um, especially working for Europeana has this one advantage. Well, working for cultural heritage institution is the, the image, you, you can't necessarily have a bit better image in that thing. Like we are the, we are the good guys, right? Like we are the libraries, the museums, the archives. Who can have something against libraries, museums, and archives? Like that helps. Um, the other thing that helps, especially in this context, is if you can speak on behalf of Europeana, because Europeana is also something which is initiated, which is funded by the member states and by the commission. You can make this argument and say like, you know, like, you want us to do all these things, you tell us, like, to increase, like, the amount of cultural heritage that is available. You also happen to be the people who are in charge of these silly copyright rules. Can you please fix them? Like, you can't just tell us, like, to do the one thing and then give us rules that basically make it impossible to, the, to do the other thing. Um, so we've been, um, but we're operating maybe a little bit more selectively, and um, this one is actually the amendment that, um, that uh, uh, Dimi brought up there, Six or like it's Paragraph. six is the paragraph six of, 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 of Julia's report, and then 264 is um, her own amendment um, to her own report. So, um, and it's a bit like, like one of the sad things about the situation, right? Is like most of the things which are actually better than the original report also come from Julia. Reda. Like, there's not so many like improvements which come from other people. Um, the, the very and I would have considered like six maybe like one of the least controversial things in there like who can have something against calling the commission to safeguard public domain which are by definition not subject to copyright um, and but as it turns out especially the EPP folks again like all of them like there's about 20 amendments which simply propose to um, delete this entire thing like just don't mention the public domain like let's talk about copyright like. Um, which, which, which I think is fairly short-sighted. Like nobody wins by that. It, it, it shows kind of like the very narrow mindset many people in the position like say like we need to increase copyright and they don't really reflect on, on the other side. Where, where here like where this one's gotten better and that's out of like I don't think we wrote that but we talked about it. It's like the the problem that I also discussed in my. Um, in, in my presentation is, is addressed head on in here where it says like any digitization of the work which does not constitute a new transformative work stays in the public domain so like the mere reproduction thing which is um, we, which which we will see how far that gets because that is not like simply one copyright rule but because like in, in essence that comes down to abolishing things like this protection for non-original photography in lots of member states and a lot of other countries. Like France has like a public sector information law which limits like the reuse of, of, of public domain stuff. All kinds of things. But like this is this is something where which which I think would be like it, it's it's relatively unlikely because this is one thing which makes it better. And I think like we and it's relatively unlikely we already win if like six stays in there as it is right now that the public domain is at least mentioned in there um, but 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 this would be really nice and then if you can go to the next one which is like the the biggest biggest problem we had with uh, Matthias work like he's reliable and Julia um, generally also, they didn't they, they didn't include in the original report something that would really help cultural heritage institutions there was one thing in it about e-lending. E-lending is extremely um, uh, controversial because e-lending is also like, um, th this is probably like one of the very few cases where you have like an almost like a, a, a zero sum game. Like either you allow like the libraries to e-lend and then people will buy less e-books or the other way around where it's about in public things. So that's, and it's important for libraries to be able to engage in electronic lending in some form or another Otherwise, libraries will become. Uh, so that is addressed in there. The question of online accessible was accessibility wasn't addressed in there. So we worked on a on a number of, of, of MEPs, and the one who 
like we like I wrote this for Marietje Schaak, who is a, uh, a liberal MEP from from the Netherlands here. Like she introduced this one to be added to the report, so there's nothing on the left, and it adds something new there. Um, calls for expanding exceptions for cultural heritage institutions to allow them to make protected works in their collection that are not in commercial circulation or available online. So basically, that would fix the inadequacies of the Orphan Works Directive, that would allow institutions with much, much less copyright clearance costs to digitize collections and make them available where there is no one to give them permission for that or license that. This is something, it's, it's, it's very difficult to judge in this case because this is a new thing, so we can't really count, like, we don't know who's against it because nobody tabled anything which is controversial with it. Um, we've done, and I don't think you've mentioned that, there's a number of other committees in the European Parliament which also give advice to the URI committee. And um, so we've got similar things in the Culture Committee, in the IMCO Committee, which is about consumer protection and uh, not in Israel. Um, and so we've, we've, we've got this language in all three of them. In one, where the amendments to the opinion were voted in IMCO, we've gotten our powers in with, like I think, 32 to 2. So um, hugely in favor. Like We don't know how that translates. Um, but So there's some hope that this gets in there. It's very, very important to get this in there, because that would signal to the European Commission, who we know is thinking about doing something that would benefit cultural heritage institutions, that there is indeed room for doing something like this in the parliament. Because whatever the commission proposes needs to go through parliament. And they are very unlikely to propose something if they know for sure that it will not go through parliament. Because like they are very much concerned about, like we want to propose something, like we don't want to be rejected. Like, um, so yeah. So this is like the most important thing from, from, from I think, the cultural heritage community. Apart from the e-lending bit, which is hugely controversial, and there's lots of things which like say, like no, no let's not cover e-lending by an exception. Let's cover that by licensing or market-driven mechanisms, as is the code word for licensing always, which is very important for the library community. But for the, for the cultural heritage community as a whole, this would be like the most important thing. So yeah, just to, to give you an overall picture of our coordination here. So the, um, let's say the cultural heritage organizations community is concentrating a lot of e-lending and access to protected works, which we as Wikimedia can't really be very active on or vocal on because it's just not what we do. Even if, if they're allowed to exhibit protected work, we would still not be able to have it on our projects. We concentrate heavily on, of course, freedom of panorama which um, of course is placed into the bigger picture, but it's also not extremely interesting for a museum to have freedom of panorama. I mean, it, it, it would be good, but not really a top priority. But in the middle, we have all these public domain parts, which for us, of course, we focus on public domain for government works, but also the general public domain safeguarding and extension is important for us since that guarantees what we can include in our project. And Larry, they, I just want to contradict yeah. you, like, not, not necessarily for museums, but for archives, like, the freedom of panorama can be, like, so the, the, the Reichsdienst Kulturelle Erfgut has um, made a substantial collection of, of all the national monuments of the Netherlands available under CC by SA, and they can do so because they took the picture of the monuments that they didn't need to clear the rights in the monuments because of we have freedom of panorama. So it's true for, for museums, it, 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 it's not such a thing, but for, for, for the archive community, um, which is often forgotten, like kind of like the, the museums and the libraries are the ones who speak to, um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of very relevant, very interesting material in archives, and they would be helped by freedom of panorama. Right. Um, still, the main thing we're we're really um, working together on is the the public domain, uh, uh, the public domain paragraphs. Which, I mean, from for now we have two problems there. Um, on one hand, um, they like nobody prioritizes it, so everybody wants to delete everything that is not a priority for anyone. So it's it's just us, and you know, since we also have to look at other things, um, not sure whether we can make it important enough. Um, and two, um, especially talking about our um, government works in the public domain thing, um, 
the Commission has the, um, the argument here that this actually would be a decision of the national governments and they wouldn't like to, to well, tell the government of France that they have to release everything they do under the public domain because the French would hate them for that. <laughs> um, and they might be right there. And also is a, uh, there is a question in the directive how much you know, the Commission can, can force upon member states in a directive. Um, on the other hand, even if this doesn't work, um, the Commission and the Parliament are actually very open to talking about this. So as, uh, if we don't win this here, at least we'll have them at the point where they already agreed they want, um, because it's non-binding. So if they agree on this, even if after that it doesn't become a, a legal directive to be implemented by the member states, we'll have the Commission in a place where they could at least introduce the rules for themselves. This is um, this, the plan, so to say, if it doesn't work. Um, of course, the, the member states will always involve the principle of s subsidiarity and they will take their ways as they want to. So it happens with the PSI uh, directive. So what, what we're expecting to happen is, um, we're talking about mainly a list of exceptions and limitations here. So for now we have only one compulsory exception in the European Union. It's for temporary copies, techn technical temporary <coughs> copies. So, when you're, so according to copyright legislation, any copy needs to be licensed. Otherwise, it's a copyright infringement. Which, idiotically, I mean, I really love this example. Um, if you have a digital hearing device, it, what it does is it, it, it makes a copy of the sound that retransmits it. So it's an automatic copyright infringement having a digital hearing device. And the only reason this is legal in Europe is that there is only one single compulsory exception in all of the EU, and it's for technical, uh, technological temporary copies. And only because of this, hearing devices are okay, and computers that also make a copy in the RAM, that would be legal, are not okay. So what the Commission is doing now, they probably won't be able to harmonize the, well, they for sure won't be able to harmonize the entire copyright regime. Uh, but they're looking at, I, my feeling is they're looking at three to find new exceptions, more exceptions that they could harmonize across the and um, this is where what we're looking at, you know, could, uh, because they're always, say, they're always asking people to square the circle. We want, everybody's asking, we want something that, um, what was it, fulfills users' expectations, um, secures authors' rights, and creates, jobs, and creates jobs, and, you know, doesn't hurt anybody and improves everybody's lives. Um, and then the commission, I mean, and they're very honest about it when you talk to them. Look, I mean, they're asking impossible things from us here. So what we're trying to do is, like, going to them and saying, look, this PDGov thing, this uh, government works in the public domain, it really doesn't hurt any authors. Everybody will get paid the same. It increases um, the culture and access to it. And so it's, it's your win-win argument. So this is how we're trying to brand, and also Freedom of Panorama, although there, the French are really strong on this non-commercial thing. And um, I have to admit, Freedom of Panorama in France and Italy are our major, let's call them battlegrounds. And um, especially the French, they are very, very hard on this. I mean, it's, it's the only time that somebody has shouted at me in, in three years in Brussels now. Um, it was an, well, it's public information. So it, it was the chef of the cabinet of the French MEP Cavada, who is a liberal who is not so liberal. <laughs> um, and uh, she basically told me that Wikipedia is stealing from authors because we share things freely. and. Um, and um, apart from this, the French photo Union of French Photographers has a position paper released where they call f for the for the stop of Wikilove's monuments because this is unloyal competition to photographers. Um, so this is like the kind of um, narrative you're up against. But it doesn't help you to just go and say that's rubbish. You just you rather have to go there and say no, no, we are for authors' rights. But you know, look at this and that and. Actually, um, we looked, uh, so what we did for Freedom of Panorama is we went really deep. We got all the architects' incomes data across Europe, and it turned out that the six countries where architects earn the most are the six countries with full Freedom of Panorama. So, I mean, <laughs> at least that helped us relativate the argument that uh, it, it's, uh, it's an income for the artist, for the author, because it clearly isn't. Um, so this is more or less what we're doing on a daily basis, and for the general for the general strategy, I think within Wikimedia we're already rather good. I mean, of course it can grow, but I mean, we have now that actually something had to be done. I wrote to different people in different countries to the contact list I have. 
and everybody I needed to got active. I mean, the French are active, the Spanish are very active, the Italians are very active, the Greek are getting active, and these are sort of the more questionable countries. Well, except for Spain. So, I mean, I feel like we're good. The next step we need to do is really reach out to cultural heritage institutions and make um, maybe a broader coalition with them so we carry more weight. So they carry more weight and we carry more weight. I think this is uh, for the yeah, next year or two or will be very important. I hope they see it the same way. One of the more interesting documents I saw recently was a UK Patent Office assessment of a whole slew of compromise amendments that had been put up. And actually, they were fairly positive and liberal about the amendments. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, particularly, if we can maybe put up Marietta Schacker's Amendment 348 again, um, which is such a crucial one for the glam sector. Yeah. Do we have opinions coming out of national capitals on this, assessments like that one from London on the compromise amendments? And can we get? those sorts of views and circulation, because again, it's one more thing for Wikipedia to say something, but if you get Berlin saying it, and Stockholm saying it, and London saying it, and The Hague saying it, that carries weight. Yeah. Um, so the only ones that are voicing really, um, let's say, a written semi-public opinion, well, the UK is doing a great job. Their property office did a report and published it, and everybody can see their position. Um, the French government is basically just writing to everybody who is French and telling them you need to kill the whole thing because otherwise the world will end. <laughs> and they actually even explicitly attack freedom of panorama. And when you call them out on this, I mean, I, okay, I won't na say the name of the association now, but it's really, you, you talk to an association of rights holders that um, has nothing to do with freedom of panorama. They would lose nothing by it. And they're, they're really attacking it. And then you ask them why, and then they're like, look, we have nothing against your thing, but we're afraid that if one thing changes, that will be a slippery slope to abolishing copyright. Mm. So you're really dealing with people who are panicking here, and who are thinking, OK, I have to save my life. And then... Um, and what is all this nonsense about abolishing copyright? Whenever I hear a French person speak on this, it's saying that Julia Rader wants to abolish copyright. Yeah, I, I think strategically the, 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 the worst thing that could happen was um, to have Julia Rader write this report, because this is a very measured report. I mean, and I really, I mean, sorry to Yulia if she's watching, but um, really, um, it but immediately, it's it. a very measured report, but immediately everybody brands it as the pirates. They want to abolish copyright. And then they, they, they stop a, a real conversation from happening. Now, if, if we had gotten sort of a liberal socialist, and there are such people, to propose the same things, we would have the debate much further now. So we, this is one thing we need to fight against to sort of make sure this is not an extremist thing, but it's actually in the middle of the, of the talk. And as to your question, no, we have no other public opinions from national governments except from the French, which are semi-public. And um, the Germans, when, whenever you talk to the Germans, they are basically, no matter whether it's their commissioner or their national ministry, uh, or their, their national minister, their position is, what does the German industry say, one, and two, what does the French government say? So that's the thing. The Germans have this reflex. We don't want to do things in Europe without France or against France. And if France says this is a top priority topic for us, then Germany will never fight France on it. Um, so this is the deadlock we have is really in France. <laughs> and like, wait a, so one of the in, maybe one of the crucial things to to understand is if if you want to understand the French position, which. I think you said that at the beginning, like you always need to, like if, if you want to make an impact, you need to understand the position of your opponents, where this comes from. Um, I think <coughs> copy, like, like everybody does, like if, if, if you're trying to, to build position, like you're first overstating your own position, so you have a fallback thing. So that is probably part where that French thing comes from and saying like this is completely unacceptable because she proposes to, to abolish copyright. They have some, some, some way to climb back. But I think that, for example, with the freedom of panorama, if you look at how that's perceived in different member states, but also in different cultures, it's, it's, it's really like the exception between where how you, how you look at what constitutes harm. And there, there seem to be two schools of what constitutes harm. Like um, the, the, the one, like, the one, like, I guess that's something that's prevalent here and a lot in our circles, if it doesn't like take away something from you, 
then it doesn't constitute harm. You see that in a lot of like the, 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 the French and also in the German positions, you see a lot, they have a different definition of harm. For them, the fact that someone else may generate extra revenue or wealth or something out of it, even if, if, if that doesn't change your own position, constitutes harm. Like the, the general thing there is always the platforms, and by that they mean Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Apple. The, the, the things which take out, like, they, they are afraid that someone else is earning money, and they, mm -hmm. they think this should go to the author. And harm is if someone else earns money, not like if you, are, if you earn less money. And I think that under, understanding that, and that's a very, like, if, if, if you're in that mindset, like a lot of those things that the French say make much more, like, much more sense than if you're going from a, a definition of harm that is like, oh, if, if I don't feel any negative consequences, then like, let, let's grow the pie, right? Um, so th th that, that helps. If you're in that mindset, it's also relatively difficult to argue against that because like accepting that mindset, also accepting a different thing of harm, but that, that, that you need to be aware of. That's what you're, what you're going against. It's not necessarily nonsensical, it makes very much like their position makes sense within their own framework of thinking about these things. And I think this is why, why the French are so allergic. They've, 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 always been, they, they've, they've always been very averse to change coming from the outside. And I think that whole internet thing is but being but perceived. They started the European for God's sakes. They, they should have waited for the things to happen in the field of copyright. They've started and initiated European. As a, as a countermeasure to Google Books digitization project. So they kind of licked the, the match, but they expected the, for the hay not to, to catch fire. But that is, that is, for example, the same person like who, 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 um, who shouted, like who's the only person who shouted at Dimi, is like, um, like, I think I'm one of the very few people from, from, from our side of the thing to go into a room from her where she, she was hostile to me at the beginning and coming out and saying like actually what you're saying makes sense because like if you if you and, and you need to be very careful because Europeana you can position in a way that it is actually something where we have a and I think the whole culture heritage sector where you can argue for a a public sphere on the internet that very much aligns with um, the conception we have of the public sphere in the physical world. Like the, the, we can say like we need to enable we need to enable these these these, these old hundred year old organizations like who who who, who, are the, like, who, who collect and, and display our culture um, to operate also online at which 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 can easily be perceived by people saying there so so they become credible alternatives to things like the big mm -hmm. platforms you think. Mm -hmm. So and, and, and because they are publicly funded and they are non profits, like that is easy to understand for people why this is a good thing. Like it becomes then very difficult, I think, for many people, especially like the older folks, to understand how how Wikipedia can be a a essentially public institution <coughs> as well, without being publicly funded, without being accountable indirectly or directly to a government and without being like so so I think for many people, like the challenge, the, 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 in the perception of, and, and that depends very much on this harm thing, like where Wikipedia, I think like for many French people, Wikipedia actually falls on the side of the platforms. Like they are the bad guys. They are the bad guys who are challenging our ways to be done. Whereas I think if you talk to people in the, in the government sector here, in the, in the, in the, also in the, in the cultural heritage sector, like you would almost find lots of people who are saying like these Wikipedia guys, they are on our side of this thing. They are the non-profit, like, like they are doing this for a, a noble goal. Um, and I think it's, it's, if, if we could highlight that somewhat more for Wikipedia, it would probably be easier to get traction in, in, those, in those very skeptical countries. Yeah, we like, sir. Yeah. Well, with the situation with France, uh, does Wikimedia France play a role in this? So we, um, to catch up, um, it was very hard for the first year and a half to get anybody really working on it. And now they have a new board member, um, Samir. 
um, and who worked for 15 years in the French Parliament as, uh, in, in the office of MPs there and is now a reporter on digital issues. And uh, he's leading their group and they are um, together, they employ the person who I think a quarter of her time is spent on advocacy. And they have two, three people in the community who now on a mailing list called lobbying at Wikimedia are, are uh, working on this. So it's it's been hard to get them off the ground at first, but now they're actually getting some traction. They're meeting the responsible minister next week. So um, they're really starting on an early on really informed campaign. Um, and they have the right people and um, it helps me a lot because, well, the way the commission works is they're afraid of proposing something that will get killed. So um, what I do now is I do sometimes re and, um, receive information from Wikimedia France about you know what's happening in their government. So when I go talk to the commission, I can always leak some information to the commission. Hey, by the way, the French minister last week said this and this in a private meeting. And then they, it actually happens that people in the commission chase me down the corridor to ask me more about the French government's <laughs> position, which sort of makes us makes people much um, more interested in talking to us also in the future. Um, so yeah, we're we're. The, the fact that we have chapters everywhere and some of them are getting active, and this network information can really be our competitive advantage in the future. Um, and um, so, so, so basically, yeah. uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm maybe free to uh, re paraphrase what Paul said, basically your job is convincing the French Wikipedia is not Google, right? Because that, that that's their big argument, like Wikipedia, even after we have existed for 15 years and we're definitely not Google, you know, we're not commercial, it's still very difficult to convince. Uh, the French and the Germans like Wikipedia is not here to make money, it's here to spread culture. Germans are fine. Germans just want to know that, that France won't hate them. <laughs> um, so, that, that's really all. Um, and yeah, France is an important thing. I mean, in the parliament, this could pass without France, and even in the council, but it would be just much easier if we soften up the French position. Although, I mean, in, already most of the parliament groups in the European Parliament see the French sort of as the outsiders. So. <coughs> Um, this has been going well, and it's it's really hard for us to explain why we don't want non-commercial, because I mean, and that's the moment where we have to leave Wikipedia as an argument and our platforms as an argument, which usually works well. We do a free encyclopedia; everybody loves it. When it comes to the non-commercial argument, we have to leave Wikipedia out completely, because you tell them, yeah, but we want it to be a full exception, not non-commercially um, restricted, because otherwise we can't put on Wikipedia. We can put it on Wikipedia, and then they ask, okay, but who makes the rules on Wikipedia? And then, we're, yeah, we came up with them. And then they're like, okay, so you want the entire EU legislation to change just because you can't change your own rules? Yes. Uh, and then this, then you you lost the argument. So that's why when you argue against non-commercial use, you need to leave Wikipedia. And um, there is a nice brochure in English and German about this, um, you know, misconceptions about NC licenses, but explaining why NC doesn't work. It's really also a long-term project that will help us with other things because there is just this reflex. Whatever comes along, we slap on an NC license on it and, and get it through. Which is very funny, right? Because they, like, because one of the things when we're is that you know, um, the where we say like for non-commercial purpose or we, when you when you throw around the terms non-commercial or out of commerce in <coughs> a, uh, in a positive way. Like if you're not fighting against them, everybody will slap you around the ears and say, "Ah, these are difficult to define. Nobody can define it. It's useless. You can't have that, right?" Like they, mm. and it's the same people who slap non-commercial to that uh, to that uh, freedom of panorama thing. Um, they'll they'll tell you if you come something like we as cultural heritage institutions need non for non no, non-commercial that never works. It's ill-defined. So it's 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 a and um, it's a difficult. Very, very difficult thing that somebody needs to figure out. I want to come back to one thing, and like this is supposed to be like a strategy workshop. So yeah. we, we seem to center in on France, and I think like it was um, Alec Tarkovsky from Comunia who made a, or who highlighted yesterday that, for example, one of the most most important cultural bodies in France or events like the Forum d'Avignon, which is this big festival or forum connected to the festival there, which lots of culture, intellectual heavyweights represented there, like he's also written an open letter um, to Juncker and said like basically don't strangle the artists, like it's a cold wind already and don't kill us, um, the, 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 the standard line. But maybe we really need to engage with them on their home turf. And the thing is like that what, what, what you get at the moment is that 
there seems to be a relatively successful part of them saying like we are cult like culture is cultural production period it's not access to culture it's not like the, the the remixing like it is really like the classical like professionals like people who devote their life to culture making culture that is what culture is that is what copyright needs to preserve and I think we need to vi somehow widen that that scope of culture to include access to culture like the the, the non professional engagement with 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 culture like the remix culture um, the Quite like the, 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 the global internet uh, stuff to it. And it may very well, like maybe we need to, to see if we can take this discussion to like to a place like Avignon instead of like always being only reactive. Why don't we like just write them back and say, well, I guess we agree with you that culture is important. Uh, we are here and we're working on strengthening culture and Europe's cultural diversity and blah, blah, blah with you. And we, we, we'd like to see how we can make that a neutral undertaking. And let's have a discussion in Avignon in like whenever the festival. Yeah. So th that that may be something. And if you can have that from from Wikimedia, from like Europeana or the associations represented by Europeana, Europeana has the advantage of also being like the chair of the board is like the director of the French National Library, which gives you some entryway into into these French things. That might be a a, a joint activity where you can bring like these things that we. Yeah. that we discussed there together. Grow the idea of what authorship and author is, because um, especially in France, I mean, the French MEP working on this set, live on camera, in a discussion, um, authors not represented by professional collecting societies are simply not talented. Um, <laughs> and, and that's why we don't need to protect their rights. Um, there were two people who wanted to say something. Yeah. Uh, you took the, the, the discussion towards uh, cultural production. Uh, I think that's a, that's a thing where, where that has been forgotten uh, throughout the discussion uh, so far, because France is rather effectively leading a battle against uh, what I would say, or what they call American cultural imperial, commercial imperialism. Uh, the Americans have a big market on the, of their own for their cultural products. France does, and uh, so they can, if the Americans wanted, they could bring cultural products for nearly nothing to Europe, undermining any possibility for the European cultural industry to be creative to make money. That's what they fear. And the thing is, we must not forget that the Wikimedia uh, um, movement originated in the United States. They are seeing this as, we are seeing Wikimedia as a pawn in that chess game. We are actually moving for the Americans. That's, that's the idea of the French. That's where their resistance comes from, I think. Mm -hmm. I think like, it's, it's slightly different. Like, I think they are, they've, they've given up a little bit on that we need to protect French. Like, it's not this cultural imperialism. What they are, concern, what, what they are concerned about <coughs> is that a larger and larger part of the, the revenue streams that play in the cultural sector um, is captured by American companies. So that whereas like in a couple of years ago you had like lots of like, like culture was mainly distributed via local companies, so it was French publishing houses, French television stations, with the internet becoming more and more important, like it is the big platforms, Google, Facebook and such, which 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 take the kind of like the distribution, like the 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 added value by that that comes through distribution that all goes to America, because like it, it is everything is on the internet. Like publishing houses are folding left and right. So more of that value, which 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 they often call a value chain, which starts with that author creating something and then goes up. Like that value chain is is very quickly absorbed by American companies, whereas in the previously it wasn't so much. It was much more a local affair. They need to become farmers. Third world farmers. 
No, but but they're yeah, paradoxically but using they're yeah. paradoxically using this for not changing copyright. Well, the, I, rea rea well, reality the reality is, is yeah. I understand the point. Yeah. The thing is, they think that the, that the cultural sector, that the European cultural sector becomes third world farmers, meaning they get the peanuts and the Americans get the big, the, 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 the big slash on top of it. And they will force the, the, the prices on the European market down and, and collect the profit and, and, and collect the profits. I understand. So this is why the, the counter argument here is: Why are there no European platforms? Why are there no European platforms that sort of reap the profits um, that go on top of this? And the reason for this is that our copyright regime is actually 28 copyright regimes. Because when Netflix started in the U.S. and there were European uh, movie sharing platforms, movie streaming platforms, Netflix had a whole market of 300 million. In, in Europe, the biggest one had a whole market of 80 million. So who developed faster and could then invest more money in clearing the rights? For clearing the rights just for France took Netflix, who already had all the rights and the connection to the US studios, five years. Five years of investments in lawyers. Now, which small European company can afford this? Um, and this is a, a function of this of not changing copyright. So this is why we need to turn, that's how we need to turn the argument around here. Yeah. Um, you had. Well, it's just as we're coming towards the end of the time, could you yeah. give us three concrete things that if we go back to our home countries, in our home country environments, people around this table can do? Yes, so number one, um, not writing, calling members of the European Parliament. If you need to target the right people right now, you can always um, get in touch with me. I'll put my email in the etherpad. Um, number two, no matter what so happens... You say not writing, but calling. Yeah, I think all, we're already at the stage where they have received so many emails that from now on only fax and phone numbers and <laughs> private meetings would actually be looked at. I mean, we're, we're, at the, we're at the stage where they have received probably hundreds of emails already on this topic. So print your email and fax it. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there, there is an automatic <laughs> platform developed by a French... Um, well, uh, by a French digital civil society um, organization, it actually, with a click, it, it, a fax comes out in the European Parliament. <laughs> sort of an, uh, a re-realization of the digital. Um, number two, no matter what happens, I mean, now we are, we are basically talking to the Commission, we're talking to the Parliament. This is something that we, the people who are in Brussels, can do much more, very effectively. I mean, of course, we always need help from people from that country, maybe from the constituency, but we can do rather effectively. After that, it will go to the member states, because this is how the EU works. And this is where it's very hard for us to influence the Italian governments, the Italian ministry, the Dutch ministry's position or any, on anything. And this is, will be important in the council and after that in the implementation. So it will come in two or three years or four years time to, to your member state. Do not wait until then to, for, like, to forge a um, like good relationship to the ministry. Uh, it doesn't have to be already lobbying now. Just do an event, invite somebody from the ministry to such a conference, do an event to get to know each other. Start you know, building links before you need them. Um, so this is the second thing. And three, well, if you're a Wikimedian, reach out to cultural heritage organizations. And if you're a cultural heritage organization, reach out to Wikimedians in your country and see how um, which points you can do together. Yeah, that I think like, I, I would have added exactly the, the same thing as the, third, as the third point. Like I think it is, the, the, these, these institutions, like they are, they are not used to lobbying, specifically not lobbying about changing policies. Like what they are good at at lobbying is like often in many countries, like you need to secure budgets or something, so they are informally, this needs to get higher on their agenda. And that comes by people talking to them. And talking to them is like what, what you mentioned. And a mechanism for this is organizing events and inviting people. Because so you're, then you're you, talking about cultural institutions. Yeah, cultural institutions. Do something, do, do an event on, on copyright reform and invite two people from cultural heritage institutions. But also from the ministry. To, uh, from the ministry, but invite these people, get them like get them there and make them think about what are we doing in this field and feed them. Like you can't like it's it's probably relatively difficult of of, 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 of calling up a museum and saying like I want to talk to the person who's 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 dealing with copyright in your museum because in nine of ten cases you probably like there is nobody or like that person is incredibly busy so you won't get through. But getting someone in 
engaged in an event, put them on a panel, talk to them, generate this feeling of urgency that there's something they can do and that they are not alone, like that they can piggyback on, 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 on activities taking elsewhere, probably will help to get, to get, or hopefully will help to get them out somewhat more forcefully. Oh. I would say that uh, examples and, I don't know, maybe simplifications or some handouts or any material that can be turned into events and discussion topics would be yeah. awfully beneficial. Uh, you indicated earlier on that if you have a report that you can show to, uh, to, to the people you try to lobby is very helpful. What are the kind of facts, the kind of reports, the kind of case studies you want to collect and that we should send to you and make your mailbox plot? Um, anything that has a university's name on it. <laughs> no, but I mean, what, 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 what should they prove? What should they support? What is, like, what are the, the things the that you are struggling thing with? The most important thing we need right now is things that put um, money values on free licenses in public domain. So I think we've very successfully won the argument and the narrative that uh, public domain and, and free licenses are good for culture and for education in general. But it's very hard for us to say, no, it's actually also good for the economy because, you know, in, in the long term, it opens up a lot of creativity and creativity is what you need to be innovative. Innovative is what you need to, to make money and to create jobs because everybody wants to create jobs, of course. I mean, this is the number one priority for any politician. So anything that uh, shows the economic value of cultural, free, let's, say, let's say, free knowledge. I have, like, from, from the perspective of specifically that argument about allowing heritage institutes to make stuff available online. Um, they, the one thing which would be very interesting and that's difficult to come by because most people don't measure that would be like the, the amount of stuff that's being digitized but not being made available online. Because there is, like we know from many organizations, like if you talk to them, they always have something that they digitize and it's awaiting rights clearance or it needs something needs to happen and i think these are from from like the institutions we talk to but that's probably self-selecting because they are very active in digitizing and it's probably a substantial number that is that is basically wasted money untapped scenario it's difficult to put money on there which would probably be a second step saying like okay and this would present so much value but the first thing would be interesting to have to have these either in surveys or as examples. Like we, for example, we've, we've just finished this project Images for the Future with like the National Archive and the, the Sound Vision. One of the most useful things that came out of the final analysis is that we have kind of like these graphs showing like okay, we've digitized this much and available is actually only this much. So there is like this untapped potential. If we can get more examples of this from other countries, I'd be very, very happy with getting that kind of stuff. Also negative examples that show how how little the state actually earns on the or the cultural heritage institutions earn on on what they have now. Because the argument is okay we have all these things and we need to make money by it. So I think we have quite a few examples from Germany and also some from the Netherlands, but Europe wide we would be happy to have more concrete examples of that. So from government copyright? And also, I mean, for all I care, I think the Rijksmuseum has this example that they earn extremely little by uh, licensing and they license Rembrandts. I mean, um, so, I mean, how much can everybody else make if they almost make no money by licensing Rembrandts? If you're a local museum, what's, what's there for you? So, I mean, if, if we have more concrete numbers and examples like this, just to deconstruct this economic point that, you know, everything needs to be protected to make money. No, it doesn't make any money, so it needs to be open to make well, I guess one, one thing, and adding to the Rijksmuseum case, because that's that's the thing that comes up a lot of times. One argument I hear a lot from Glantz is like, yeah, the Rijksmuseum is very rich, they have lots of money, lots of, of big paintings, we don't have that. So, you know, aside from the Rijksmuseum, it's also nice to have like an institution that's not as big, doesn't have as much money, but does free the license media. So you can show, no, it's not just the big ones, also the small ones also uh, are better off by licensing it free. I've written a paper about it that will present uh, in an hour. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, then uh, I think we're through. Yeah, cool. I'll, I'll remain over lunch in case anybody has questions and <laughs> wants to chit chat for you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.